going to bring your two yards of muslin today? Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. So zero waste in general. It's pretty self-apparent by the name, right? Zero waste. It's any garment that you create and there's absolutely no waste. That's why I told you guys not to cut off your selvage. A lot of zero waste garments feature that selvage on the exterior of the garment because maybe you're working with some really nice fabric that has some really pretty, intensive or complex selvage. Have you seen fabrics that use like metallic threads and bright colors and they pay attention to the design of their selvage? They use that for the out seam of your jeans, really well-made jeans. So when you cuff them, you can see that selvage. It's like a point of pride. But so you keep selvage on your fabric. You don't cut any corners off. You keep everything intact. If you do take away any shapes or little spaces that help fit or make necklines or armhole shapes, you find a way to use those little pieces in other ways, whether it's cuff, facing, maybe a fly shield, stuff like that. With this process, zero waste, we're familiar with a process that is very conventional in that you design your look, you draw it out, you make a nice illustration, you hand that to the pattern maker, they make the patterns, and then uh, the cutter decides the layout of these patterns. And obviously you can make a position, a layout of patterns and position them in a way that it will be the most effective while still staying true to those conventional shapes. But um, this is not how we do zero waste production. All of those things happen at the same time. We're designing, we're thinking about the patterns and the layout, their relationship, when we're cutting, cutting the shapes out of the fabric, that all has to happen at the same time while you're doing it. It's like a touch and go back and forth and developing these can take a really long time for that matter, depending on the complexity of the garment and the pattern. So why do we want zero waste? First of all, obviously it's no waste. It's better for the environment. We wanna keep all scraps out of the bin, out of the landfills. Secondly, this allows us to stumble upon new silhouettes that we would never dream of if we were just sketching a look. With our brains and creative capabilities, we're always pulling from something we've seen before, right? It's always something that's already happened and even if we don't realize it fully, it's something subliminally that we've seen and it's in the back of our mind and then we sketch it, some iteration of it. But because we're kept to this requirement of keeping all little bits of our fabric in this design, it forces us to create these new silhouettes. And so it's very experimental. Sometimes they are beautiful new silhouettes. Sometimes it doesn't work. That's fine, you just start over, do it differently. The third thing why zero waste is so great to, um, for you guys especially to start doing and thinking about right now is because it's so technology friendly. Works well with Flow, SketchUp, Adobe Illustrator, anything that you can draw digitally with measurements and like any unit of measure to make sure you're staying in scale. This allows you to test your theories especially with Clo, if you guys, any of you have taken Clo yet. I know Alex has, Megan has. Um, it allows you to test out your theories in 3D, virtual 3D. But, so this is perfect for Clo. It goes hand in hand with it. Okay, so these three pictures, if you can see it. Is there a bad glare on the TV from the, is it okay? So you can have very simple to very complex and then moderate over here. You guys remember this one? Yeah, the Balenciaga coat. Remember when Miss G handed that out? This is a, an example of a very simple zero waste garment. The second one is a very thought out and well-planned pattern 
to get a zero waste garment. You'll also notice that not many of these pattern pieces look familiar. They don't look like your typical sleeves, your typical front bodice, etc. And this one over here, all made from triangles. And why this works so well, working with just geometric shapes, is because they fit perfectly together and they use up all of your width, no matter what width, length, it works. So historically, we've seen zero waste from the beginning of time. When people were wearing little fur pelts, they didn't cut anything away. It was just the edge of the fur, the hide, and that was it. And likewise, the Japanese kimono, when they would make kimonos, they had precious panels of fabric that were smaller, woven on a small uh, bed that it was very special. They weren't gonna cut this up, they weren't gonna uh, mince it, whatever, but they just used rectangles to create these kimonos. Same with the Chinese trousers, traditionally, all made with rectangles. So we've seen this in history. It's been here for a long time it's just now beginning to be like a hot topic trend type of thing because we are forced to consider the environment, rightly so. Xandra Rhodes, she's a designer from the 1980s known for her prints. This is one of her designs. In the 1980s, people weren't talking about zero waste, but she was doing it. And she developed this design in conjunction with this print and the layout of these blocks to work exactly how she intended it when this was sewn together. So think about it like that. With the printing technology that we have, this can work really well together. So now let's move into the techniques of how you guys are going to one, start this exercise, and two, develop your sketches later on into zero waste patterns. So the first thing I wanna talk about is pattern cutting, zero waste pattern cutting. This is a common thing that you'll hear when uh, reading, talking, hearing about zero waste. It refers to figuring out, just like we were looking at before, figuring out the layout of the pattern and getting it to a spot where it's the most efficient use of the fabric. And this can change the shape of your patterns a little bit. This is one way that we're able to develop conventional shapes into zero waste friendly shapes. <clears throat> However, I want to point something out on this <coughs> slide though. You see these tiny gray spots right here one, two, three, four. Those are all waste on this layout. They did a dang good job putting all of this together, right? The waste is like, I don't know, 2%, if that, maybe 1%, but it's still not zero waste. It has to be everything. This is low waste. And you can't claim zero waste if it's like this can't cheat it, you gotta just go by honor system and say yes, I used those to face my uh, upper buttonhole closure or something. You gotta find a way to use that or either change these shapes to exactly meet the other shapes that you're lacking, right? So this is one of Holly McQuillan's so you're gonna hear this name a lot. This is her book that she co-authored with Tim Rasanen. And he, she and he are, have been working in zero waste for so long. They've done graduate studies about this. They've clearly written a book. They do lectures. They go all around uh, to different universities talking about their methods. They are really, some of the for the like pioneers of this, this technique of garment designing. Um, 
So I bring that up because this book is something really good to look at, even just if you want to flip through it when you're starting your exercise. But also if you want to get it yourself, it's not expensive and it's very interesting. You will read it like you won't put it down. It's so interesting. It shows you all sorts of plans for zero waste. She's very uh, generous with all of her patterns that she's developed that has taken her many months and years to do. Uh, she gives them all away in this and uh, it has a lot of interviews with other zero waste designers that are cool to hear how they think about things when they do zero waste. So that's here for looking at in a bit. Um, with this though, just as we were talking about when this was up before, these are rectangles mostly that she's working with. And she has a jacket that looks pretty close to what you would normally see. You have a lot of volume here in the back Sort of like when we did those tunnel sleeves, the bat wings, that shape, it gives you a lot of volume and dragging right here when you put your arm all the way down, but it still works. You sort of have to um, give up fit for zero waste a little bit, unless you use, <clears throat> unless you use elements of shape. So you can see she put her rectangles horizontally together instead of a, a normal concept of up and down for your center back line. So sort of think about it in that way a little bit. Which brings us to approximation patterning. And we've touched on it a little bit already, but this is one of the bigger ways if you are trying to get a very, what should I say, familiar design you know how we have very familiar silhouettes happening a lot in design. It's like an A-line dress or a vest. That's something that happens, you know, we see it uh, in stores, everywhere. If you wanted to stick with something that was very familiar like that, you would have to then take your conventional shapes that you knew you needed to get the original, the straight up vest or dress and then pattern it, lay it out, and see what modifications to those shapes would have to be made so I could fit it together and have no waste, basically. So it's a lot of back and forth. But the one thing interesting that I want to show you about this is that this little triangle right here in the center is the fly. They have two more right here, so one is probably the shield and then the facing. And that's not a typical shape for a fly shield and facing. That's not what we have patterned in school, right? It's the little J shape and then the straight line. So throw those types of ideas out the window. Normal shapes, conventional pattern shapes, not a thing anymore. Another helpful thing, if you're developing this, color coding. It allows you to match up your patterns and the corresponding pieces. So obviously sleeve, upper and under. And then you have pocket, lining, facing, or bag. No, elbow, elbow pads or something. But this color coding, especially if you're working digitally, can really help keep things organized. Technology, like you're we saying, goes hand in hand, like Sandra Rhodes. Printing out an entire piece of fabric, maybe on Spoonflower or whatever print uh, company you prefer. Each one of these patterns is in a different print and then used accordingly. So you can um, not only have a single piece of fabric, but you don't have to buy all different bolts. For making the patterns for zero waste fashion, would you like cut out the pattern on a big square or would you cut out each of the pieces and then just know how they would fit together on your fabric? 
Would you cut like, out as a big square? Would you have, making a top to one pattern piece, which is a big square with all the markings? Uh -huh. Or would you have like 15 different pattern pieces that you would have to kind of cut out and then just have some sort of indication of one and the other along the side? If I'm understanding correctly, both. Okay. You both would be correct, if it, whichever worked best for you. Okay. Um, but if I'm not answering that correctly, let's talk I more. Think that's correct. I think that's correct. Okay. So this is Holly McQuillan, um, New Zealand designer, like we were talking about, has done a lot of work with zero waste. Here's one of her patterns, and it's perfectly utilizing every scrap of this fabric. Notice how there aren't many straight lines here, like we were talking about with the geometric shapes, uh, triangles, rectangles, rhombosoid, rhomboids, parallelograms, whatever. So she has all these curves in here that work because we do have a lot of natural curves on the body. As long as you have that corresponding piece that works with it, great. The other thing that she's known to do a lot is use paper for testing out your theories before going into fabric. Otherwise, you can go into fabric but a smaller scale. Same situation, you're just testing it out on smaller scale. And I'm gonna hand out computer paper so you can do some planning, but just by cutting out those shapes and taping them together, you can get a feel for if that theory of shape is gonna do what you thought it is. Here's the Timo Risana guy. Um, he has a very similar way of zero waste development. Here's one of his patterns. So you can see um, it's a lot of time that goes into that. He didn't just think, oh, I'm, I'm speaking for him, but this is pretty obvious, that he didn't just see that in his head and was like, this is gonna work. He spent months going back and forth like this shape is needed here. Let me drape it. Oh, actually it changed to this. Let me put that on paper. I take that to the form. Oh, I need to change that. Go back to the thing I was planning. It's a lot of back and forth. So don't be afraid of, of spending that time of reworking things. And it's okay to do that. In fact, you should be doing that. Reworking and being okay with it. So the next thing after pattern cutting, which is the more uh, direct, like pattern making version of this, subtraction cutting. This was developed by a designer, Julian Roberts. He's London based. And he had supposedly had trouble in school seeing or understanding what these conventional pattern shapes were doing in the way of fitting around the body and different body parts. Like we know what a sleeve looks like and why it works on the arm, but his brain didn't work like that quite. So he came up with this method of subtraction cutting and it focuses more on the negative space that you're creating rather than the outward shape and silhouette and volume you have with your fabric. So with this, Again, like the other one, it's the same. You're throwing conventional pattern shapes out the window. You want to focus on how the body is going through the garment. How is it going to be put on, basically, and how is it going to live when it's adjusted and fully on the body? The negative space for the body to live in. This is very experimental and even more so than pattern cutting, zero waste pattern cutting, you're gonna find really abstract and new silhouettes with this. So I, my opinion of this is not the best. So some of these are really cool looking, really attractive pieces, successful. And other times I think it's the worst thing ever because sometimes it looks like a pile of fabric on the dress form or a body. And I didn't, it doesn't look like there was any intention behind the design. These pictures I picked out because they were successful in my eyes, that they were working. He uses this 
panel of fabric to wrap around the body to get some coverage and a base for this other piece of fabric to be housed. This one I particularly like, and this is more like the plug and displacement technique that he also developed. So the plug technique is his idea as well. It is an implementation of this. It's a way to get to subtraction cutting. So if you look at this shape, this right on the side seam of what would normally be the side seam of the dress, there's a really abstract shape. We don't have any conventional pattern shapes like this in our pattern making. But the thought of this, the idea behind plug and displacement or the plug technique is that if you have a sewing area or a length, whatever unit of measure you want to do, if you have an area that is hypothetically 100 inches long, and this sewing area or sewing edge is also 100 inches long. Doesn't matter what shape, what seam, doesn't matter. You can sew that to this and you will get some crazy fit and volume happening, but it will fit together as long as they're the same sewing distance. So if you had a longer one, you do what we do, like pleats or gathers to shorten it so it would fit into it. So that's the plug, um, plug technique. Here's some of his work where you can see a clear top of a dress, front and back, where they would just meet right at the shoulder and sew up like normal. And then you have all of this remainder happening down here. So it's a lot of testing. He has a pretty strong idea, since it's his technique and he's developed it so much, of what this is going to do when it happens. Probably at least in general what it's gonna do. This I put up here because I thought it was a really successful one of his that I thought looked beautiful and that the pattern um, he has is very interesting uh, because you have, and hopefully you guys can see it over there, these circles in this fabric right here would all be placed on top of each other. You can see the directions. One goes on top of one, two goes on top of two, three goes on top of three. And that creates this specific volume for this dress because the body would live through those holes, right? That's getting a little bit advanced though. That's getting into one, very artistic, and two, a lot of time and development. We only have a week to do this exercise, so. So this one um, isn't like a well-known phrase of referring to zero waste, but I just call it this because that's the most a uh, common sense phrase I could think of, but it literally is just talking about draping and keeping zero waste in mind. So I call it freestyle draping. And this is why I wore this dress today, is because it's a good example of the very simple style of zero waste. You don't waste anything, but here's the simplest, one of the simple, it's nearly as simple as the Balenciaga one. So with this one, I knew that I had this fabric laying around that I wanted to use, right? It's an old silk, raw silk mall, and it's about 14 years old. I had it from when I was in school for a project and I never used it. But I was like, you know what? A while ago, I was like, I'm gonna make something out of this. So I took the entire piece that I had, which was about two yards, and I held it up to my dress form, and I said, what would look good in this? either maybe some like really cool summery pants or maybe a little summer dress. And I went with a dress clearly and I wanted to do a tent dress out of it. So when I held it up to the dress form, I could see that the width of my fabric was way too much if I wanted to use the entire thing. So I just trimmed off this little bit off the entire thing. 
as long as I'm using this whole amount, we're good. You can use this for either facing the hem or a whole other project if you want. Just save it another day, okay? Then how I develop that is a really simple, and you guys can probably already see what happened. I knew that I wanted my shoulder line to be right in the center of my length. So I took it off the dress form, I put it on the table, I found my middle, my center of both the cross grain and the straight grain. I dotted that in with whatever marking tool you wanna do, just so I knew I had balanced lines to know where to cut. So I wasn't off center and blah, blah. Then I made a hole for the neck or the head and I cut down center front. So I have now this slash into the center like a T basically to open up center front. Then I needed to make some sleeves. This should look familiar to you because it's similar to the others that we've done. It's like a baby tunnel sleeve or bat wing. I was very intentional with the degree of this angle though. I wanted it to be a 90 degree angle so I could then have an exact 90 degree to face this opening of the center front of the dress, okay? So that's what happened. And I didn't put it on as a regular facing where it finishes it off and then goes inside. I left it on the outside to be a little style element, like it's a fake lapel almost, and just finished it off with binding instead of having a raw edge on underneath. So then you think, all right, I've gotten rid of two of my tri triangles. I have two left. Where am I gonna put those? I was thinking, what does the dress need? It's a pretty flimsy fabric. What if I gave some structure to the shoulder area, which is all the strain. That's the biggest part of the body that puts strain on the dress. So with these 90 degree, <clears throat> These two are crossing in the back with the biggest part coming to the end of my cuff and then they cross right in the back going like this to face the back neckline and also give stability and strength to the shoulder area. And they're hand stitched into place like applique to the inside of my dress. So it sort of is just a a functional fix at that point. So when you guys start your exercise, here are some ways to think about starting to get the ball rolling. You can start by just putting your cloth on your dress form, getting an element or a volume, some little piece of silhouette that you really like. Keep that as your focus. So you're like, feature element that you want to keep and then fix everything around it to make it work however you like it to work. Use folding. All these shaping elements that we're used to using, darts, gathers, tucks. You can go even more creative. It doesn't have to be those simple conventional ones. Get more artistic. Fabric manipulation can happen any number of ways. You've got a lot of options of fabric manipulation to obtain fit. You can also think about it like um, origami a little bit, like folding paper. If you have any experience in that, that will help a lot with trying to get um, sort of irregular shaping elements. Another way to begin this is by First, having an idea in your head, then taking some of this computer paper, and if you draw your fabric, the best um, to scale as you can. Say you have two yards and then you know your width, an easy scale is to go one foot to one inch, and that will usually fit on this paper. So you know what shape you have to work with, and then Take your initial idea and use a geometric shape out of it. Then pre-cut a big shape, something that you know you might need before you go to the dress form with it. 
That's the sort of a, another option you can go with. So some designers, Carlos Villamil, he uses geometric shapes with his zero waist. These geometric shapes are smaller though. It's closer, or I guess you could also call it modular fashion. Have you guys heard of modular yet? Yeah, so this is really sort of up and coming. It's bigger in Asia and they're schooling, but you're putting smaller pieces together that can be disconnected easily, possibly even by the customer or the wearer. So you have multiple designs in one outfit pretty much. You sort of have supplies, building blocks to make multiple designs. Um, so this is what he does. This is how he got this pink dress, which is very simple again. All rectangles, it wraps around the body. And all he does is use little darts right here for some bust shaping. Think about this also, if you had a strip of fabric that was on bias and it was like a rhomboid that has, uh, you have your edge of your fabric here and you have a bias strip like this. If you were to take that one strip <coughs> and wrap around your arm, so it, just that one strip, sew it together so it wrapped as a spiral around your arm, you're creating a tube around your arm that is the same thing that a conventional sleeve pattern does. So there are other ways to find the same result than just using our conventional shapes, okay? Um, mm -hmm. How do you get out of it? Now I'm looking at it. How do you actually get out of it? It probably it has... I think it's like... It could have a number of things. So, but that's a really good point to bring up because while you're doing this, remember how we have to be thinking of all of this while we're doing it? We're designing it, we're pattern making it, and we're considering the relationship of these shapes together. We have to think about the closure and how we get in and out of this. So that's a really good point. You have to have a closure. You can't just have a sculpture on a dress form and call it done. It's gotta be functional. But I'm sure it's somewhere. It does seem like there's probably a really inconspicuous, um, like underneath magic, hidden magic somewhere doing it. It's not just like a straightforward side seam zipper or something. But yeah, there, it could be a number of things. She was sewn into it possibly. So here's Yuli Lai Tang. Um, this designer also works with geometric shapes, but definitely more complex than what you just saw. So this is gonna give you more interest with your design, but it definitely takes more time, more development. Do you remember VNA? She obviously pioneered bias, the use of bias in her garments, but this is also a zero waste design that she did way back in the day, 1900s, early 1900s. And just by the use of these two squares on bias, she was able to create one of the most iconic and classic form-fitting or flattering, I should say, garments in fashion history. Very simple. Modular fashion, we just talked about that. Um, this is a, a really cool idea, but this also takes a lot of development and more than what we have for this project. But keep in mind for later, this is cool, this is really great. What was that on the left? What is that? This one? Or this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leather pieces. So you can get zero waste because all of these rhomboids are parallelograms, I should say, fit together perfectly. And then the uh, little connectors are uh, essentially just off the side of, oh, you know what? I thought when I was looking at that, I thought these were separate pieces, but you would have to then 
they're they're connected. So I wonder how they get around they're having so yeah, but so I thought it was just this whole like a piece, yeah. an eye that was separate, and then you have these pieces. But they're connected right here, so each side has a little T off of it, and that stops it from being able to fit together perfectly. Yeah, they do that, but this is, there's no cut right here. It has yeah, it comes off the of it. And I was thinking that it, it was completely separate when I saw it at first, so they could get full usage out of these shapes fitting together perfectly. But it's some other slight variation of it. No, it's very, like, one of a kind. Other techniques also consider zero waste that are more familiar to us, like knitting, weaving, crochet, macrame, felting with wool. You're just using exactly what you need to get what you're, you're trying to get. So felting is considered zero waste. Patchwork. If you have a bag or a box of scraps, scrap fabric at home and you were to use that to patch together a garment, that's zero waste. Just like we have out in the hallway, that bin of scrap fabrics, you could use that to create anything you wanted. And by using such small pieces, you can get whatever fit you want. This is Zero Waste Daniel. Everybody knows about him, right? Yeah. Um, Study New York is a great, great website that you guys should know and look into. They are actually moving more into consulting for companies, helping them get to more ethical practices, whatever way it might be. But they also have more, um, they have collections, they feature collections on their website that designers use your waste or more whatever ethical thing they choose to use. So Study New York is a big time uh, company or brand that you need to know about. This weaving is interesting because we're not just talking about tiny yarns that you weave a piece of fabric together with. Weaving can also be like big strips of fabric. If you were to take four inch width panels of your muslin and weave that together, that is also weaving, you know? And we only have a couple more slides, so hang with me. So this really quickly, talking about sizing and grading your sizes with zero waste. It's not as easy as it, it is with normal. And normal patterns, it is very difficult. It's, it's a science behind it. Uh, so you have one-offs, what you guys are gonna make in a little bit. This next exercise, you're just creating one-offs, doesn't matter. You don't have to think about sizing it later on. It's just an art piece and making it one of a kind sort of makes it more desirable. People covet things that no one else can have when you do things just one of a kind. But if you were to try to mass produce this or at least pattern it so you could produce it later on for multiple people, you have to consider the width of your fabric and what is required out of your, your shapes, your pattern shapes. So this one's a very simple example. They're just taking a front and a back. They're exactly the same in their puzzle, piecing them together to use every last bit of the whip. That's great. It's simple and perfect. You can't get any better than that. But let's say they needed a bigger size. This is one way of, of getting around this. So having such a loose silhouette, a loose fit of a garment, this is, you can claim one size fits most. So you don't have to think about grading so much. But in typical grading, grading up or down, you would need not only this dress to get wider, but you would also then do a little bit longer. So that changes everything about that. You can easily go wider in this shape 
but you don't have any room to get wider unless you, you encroach on the size of your sleeve opening or ask for a wider width of fabric. So what else can I do? I could flip my shirt this way and then have my two pieces fitting together like this. And that would take care of the um, length issue. I could get more length this way because the length of your fabric is sort of the infinitive, infinity um, element. But you have to take into consideration this, your width of your fabric. Sometimes you have the capability of asking your fabric mill to make a specific width. But the more complex your designs get, the more iffy your size grading gets. Uh, that's why it's good to try to do one size fits all if you can. What about this picture? Look familiar? Yeah. Yeah, so that was the, um, the header on our home page, our landing page for last semester. I put this up here because they all are good designs that could be developed for zero waste, if they're not already zero waste, because they look like they are. Um, they're all gorgeous designs and they look like they're using every last bit of their fabric. What do these have in common with each other, guys? There's a lot of fullness in the skirt. A lot of fullness in the skirt, yep, exactly. Zero waste is synonymous with fullness and volume in the silhouette. You're keeping all of that fabric in there so you have extra volume. You control that with the, the shaping elements. So it's sort of a trade-off. You're getting rid of fit, easy fit, but you can bring it back a little bit with shaping elements, okay? Here's McQueen's recent collection. And I put this up here because these also look like they were zero waste. All of these could be easily developed for zero waste patterns. So the last slide is what I want you guys to keep in mind when you're doing this exercise or any zero waste project. So start simple. You don't wanna to go too complex, especially with our time limit right now. Simpler is better. Think geometric shapes. Try to fit together shapes and imagine what they would do. Try it out on paper. Conventional rules are out the window with this one. Try to compartmentalize that and keep it away from this process. It's hard to do, but it will make it a lot uh, more free for your brain to sort of go around. Um, Straight grain, straight grain also. You know how we are sort of super strict about grain? Doesn't matter. Straight grain doesn't matter. Cross grain doesn't matter. Bias still is good. It helps you when you're trying to go around corners and get some growth or stretch to your fit. And uh, that's where triangles can come in handy if you want to get a bias. The properties of bias, use triangles because you have those three sides, one of them are go is going to be on bias, or if not two, yeah, two or probably, at least one, maybe two, but bias and triangles go hand in hand, you're going to lose fit, use your fabric manipulation to gain fit, whether that's really artistic abstract fabric manipulation, or if it's our conventional tux gathers, please, blah, blah. Uh, consider modular fashion, but maybe not for this one. That's a little bit more advanced and will take a lot of your time. And remember, just because you reached zero waste with your garment design does not mean it's a successful garment. It has to be one that doesn't hurt for the wearer to wear it. It's not like painful for the person to have it on, that they can actually get into it and out of it. And that they think it's cool. They wanna wear it, they would buy it. They think it's pretty or whatever. It has to be aesthetically either interesting or cool and 
looked like it wasn't just haphazardly thrown on, on the form. And then being a novice is optimal with zero waste. If you guys came into this without having gone to school at all, it would be like the biggest benefit ever with this because it's no rules. It's none of the conventional stuff you've learned. This is all about experimentation. So having said that, you guys are going to have a lot of back and forth. You're gonna be like dress form. And you know, some of the people in the first section had beautiful drapes by the end of class. Uh, so it doesn't have to take a long time, but I do encourage you to, if you're not feeling it or it's not working quite, then just start over. It doesn't take that much time, a couple of minutes to just scrap it and start over. Um, 